All right, guys, you and I know it. There's a mile long list of things that could be done to help improve your portfolio, help you be successful as a designer and make it in the industry. And honestly, I wish I could reach through the computer and find out exactly what it is that you keep doing that makes it so you get ghosted. We hate getting ghosted. What can you do about it? Lots of things. But today, I'm gonna to talk about one, and that is simply to move on. If you still got some of those same old projects from school, and you keep massaging them and reformatting them and putting them back out there, hoping that somehow that the solution's gonna get better and better and better over time, stop. Now, don't get me wrong, reformatting things and making changes to existing products can be a good thing. I'm not saying that everything that you've already poured a bunch of time and effort to is into is useless, but there's value in cutting the cord, moving on and starting over with something new. Raise your hand to the square and say, I promise I will do something new to add to my portfolio because that can be the one thing that helps you be memorable Noticeable. Now, be smart about the thing that you choose to do. There's like this divide that we have as a design community because there's like the stereotypical crap that we keep seeing over and over and over and over again in our portfolios. But those are the people that seem to be getting attention and getting jobs, right? And then here you are, a smart intellectual, who is innovative and has come up with other solutions that don't necessarily fit whatever popular brand language is going through portfolios these days. It's not that you're a bad designer. Sometimes you have to be smart and play the game a little bit. You have to almost have like your staple popular um, looking products in your, your eye candy in your portfolio that'll get attention and then the other thought out stuff that's equally as good but isn't sexy, as sexy as the other things, um, can help seal the deal. Not everything is going to match this brawn, minimalist, um, machined aluminum motif that we keep pushing out there, but it's cool looking and it gets attention for a reason. So, use that. Remember that sometimes you gotta play a little bit of the game to get ahead. Put some of that stuff in your portfolio, add new products, and as much as it might just make you so conflicted inside, know that with the way that the culture is right now and what studios are looking for, um, you have to go through some of those hoops. Um, and I hope to change that. I hope we can change that. I hope that we can make it so that not everything has to look like part of the same minimalist family. I don't know. I don't know exactly how to word it, but I, let, needless to say, I have felt your frustration. I really have. Nothing is more frustrating than having dedicated so many years to getting a degree, um, coming up with solutions, doing designs, and then just being stuck and somehow unemployable and never hearing back, not getting the interview over and over and over again. Um, and the only thing I can say that has helped me and can help you break the chain and the cycle is to kick, is to quit kicking the dead horse over and over again with your old projects, move on, pick something new, find a mentor who's working at the place that you want to be working at, or is in the same field or heck, just reach out to me. I'm just going to throw up my, I'll throw up my, my phone number right here. You guys shoot me a text anytime if you have questions and you would like to collaborate and talk about something um i'm here to help let's be successful let's reshape the industry and um get you something new in there that's some food for thought my one little tip cut the cord do something new start with something else um, i can't stress how much that can really help you help your portfolio and jump start your motivation once again okay stick around Right after this brief message, we're going to be introducing today's guest speakers. Don't go anywhere.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Glad that you're still here with us. It is now time for me to introduce today's guest speaker. Joining us is the one and only Tim Walsh. Tim is a professional speaker, author, game designer, and filmmaker. As a play advocate, Tim is out to prove play is a means through which we find our passion, peak curiosity, encourage problem solving, spark creativity, and promote intrinsic motivation. A 30-year veteran of the toy industry, Tim's design and co-designs of games have sold over 7 million copies in 13 countries and include the games Tribond, Blurt, Mad Gab, Feed Fuzzy, Bullseye, and many others. Tim's latest game, Mega Mouth, the game of reading lips from Big G Creative is now for sale exclusively in Target stores nationally. You can learn more about it and other classic games on his YouTube series, Where's the Fun From, linked down below. Tim, thanks for joining us on The Variable. We're glad to have you here with us today. Hey, Russell, how you doing? <laughs> doing great, Tim. I am very excited to have you with us today. Um, I've been following your career for a while now, and I'm just cool. excited to to have you uh, share your insight with all of us. Uh, I know there's a number of product designers out there who would like to get a foot into the industry, maybe a toe. And I think that having some insight from a veteran such as yourself is just gonna help us all. So to set the stage a little bit for us, there's a few different topics that I wanna hit on. And first one being the nature of the industry. Is it really all fun and games? That being the first one. Second that we'll hit on is how it all works. The business of toys and games. And number three, for all of us creatives that are out there, inspiration, flow, and becoming doer of deeds. So, to kick things off with our very first question, I well, let's keep it casual a little bit here. Can you tell us how'd you get your start? Paint us a picture of what it's like trying to break into the toy industry and in game industry at like ground zero. What was that like? Yeah, that was 30 years ago. So <laughs> okay. I think like a lot of people, if there's a hit toy or a hit game on the market, sometimes that inspires people to enter that field, right? So that was the case sure. for myself and a couple of buddies. We were freshmen at Colgate University and uh, Trivial Pursuit exploded. This was 1983, okay. 84. They sold 20 million copies. Everyone on campus was playing the game. And we found out that two of the inventors had attended Colgate. And we were like, wow, Your that university? sort of oh, okay. brought it close to home. And sure. my friends and I said, we should invent a game because we heard those guys own golf courses in Canada and you know, we just thought that's so <laughs> sure. cool. But we didn't have an idea for a game, so we sort of abandoned that idea. And then in 1987, our graduation year, Pictionary hit it big, and then in 88 sold 9 million copies. And we thought, well, this is a sign from God. If two games come <laughs> sure. out while we're in college, we have to come up with a game. And we did a game called Tribond. So that was our first yeah. game. In so that was your first game. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, let's, let's, I don't know. I don't want to say air some laundry. Let, let's paint a real picture. Cause I think you, uh, like many others fall victim to the rose colored lens of the, the few who hit that big wave of success and yeah, have their own golf courses and all of that stuff and, sure. and are, have fame and fortune. Not everybody gets to that point. So can you like paint the picture for us of like, what is the market like? I mean, I can make assumptions and I look at the shelves in retailers and there's a lot of games out there. So as my assumption is, it's kind of cutthroat, but I'm going to let you elaborate on that. Having been in the trenches a lot more, um, what is it like? I mean, it, it maybe you can compare what it was like then and talk about what it's like now. What does it sure. take to make get that breakthrough and, and find your way in? Well, the toy industry is the greatest industry in the world, right? Because you're you're dealing with play and play is so important to kids and adults too. So it's a wonderful sure. industry, but it's it's a business, right? So in that regard, it yeah. is cutthroat. It was a $23 billion industry when I got in into it, maybe 22, and now it's 32. So it's jumped quite a bit. And recently, uh, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, with COVID. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, for us, it was timing. In 1990, many trivia games had come on the wake of Trivial Pursuit and failed. Tony Randall had a trivia game and Time Magazine had a trivia game because everyone thought trivia was hot. But the truth sure. is, Trivial Pursuit was hot and trivia yeah. <laughs> really wasn't. And our game came out just at the right time when all those games kind of came and failed. And my, you know, I've written three books on toys and in my research, yeah. timing plays a huge part in if a game or a toy makes it. Um, there's sure. uh, plenty of examples of toys that came out uh, and didn't succeed. And then years later, a very similar toy comes out and it's, it, it, it's the right toy at the right time. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that the playing field is leveled quite a bit now you know we were before okay. the internet and games uh it was strange how games worked you know if the movie industry back in the day when people went to theaters worked mm -hmm. like the game industry if you had a new movie you would have to try to get into theaters alongside of jaws and casablanca and gone with the wind and all the greatest imagine if all the greatest movies that ever existed we're still playing in theaters that's how the game industry works right because you walk into target and monopoly's still there and scrabble's still there and all the classics are still there and you have to try to get on the shelf and find your little piece of real estate next to games that are, are not going anywhere now with the internet of course movies uh are the, the loving field uh, playing field has been more leveled and movies stream all the time and you can stream any movie so the analogy doesn't quite work anymore. And games, you know, right. people are launching games on Kickstarter and selling directly to consumers. So those things didn't exist when I broke in 30 years ago. So sure. Okay. Oh, we're good. That's another rabbit hole. We're going to have to go down <laughs> as far as like crowdfunding, Kickstarter. Um, and okay. But before I get down there, I, I do want to know, okay, so elaborate on your story a little bit when you had your first game that you started what were some of the like so kickstarter and other crowdfunding platforms makes it a little bit more accessible to get funding um what were you guys doing when you started your first game to scrape enough pennies together to get a manufacturer to make your first run or did you make a prototype and you license it what was the story behind it we self-produced to begin with. The three of us didn't okay. have any money. So we raised money through friends and family. We raised $32,000 and started a corporation and, and said, if you, if you support us, you know, we're going to try to make this game go. We printed 2,500 games. And you had mm -hmm. asked earlier, Russell, you know, Trivial Pursuit came out in 79 and didn't really hit till 84. So it was the overnight success that took five years, right? Ours was right. a similar trajectory. We came out in 89, launched mm -hmm. a toy fair in 90, but it wasn't until, oh, geez, 94, 95, that the game really took off. So we started self-publishing, selling to mom and pop stores, and, uh, you know, eventually got into bigger stores. We, we started in Philadelphia because I grew up in South Jersey. So Strawbridge and Clothier, a department store that's no longer with us, uh, supported mm -hmm. the game, and we just slowly uh went from there and then our printer who we hired to print the game eventually licensed that game and that printer was called patch products they're now called play monster huge toy company and tribon played a, a pretty important role in growing that company to where it is now sure. which is uh pretty cool okay that's great and i'm and i applaud you guys for your success and tenacity because i think where most people they get in at the beginning, they try to get some traction and they don't make it past those first few years of very bad sales and, and not very much success to see it explode. And um, and, and that's a good takeaway for anybody who's thinking of getting in the toy in the game industry um, that I think that with the rise of digital age, there's going to be some things that are exceptions to the rule and others that are tried and true things that hold fast regardless of the times that we live in. And I think that uh, understanding that your product launch is a marathon race instead of a sprint. I, I mean, we have uh, delusions of grandeur. I think that, oh, I'll put a Kickstarter campaign together and it's going to blow up um, and be even crazier than, you know, exploding kittens who 
what I don't know how many million they made tons and tons on their campaign. Million, yeah. yeah, and it blew up most of the time. It's a slow rise to fame, you know. <laughs> and sure and I can and I I only I guess I talk on that and when I say that I I say it from firsthand experience because um I was one of those people too. <laughs> I've mentioned on the show multiple times that I designed and launched a game. This game is nuts. Developed it, um, funded it on Kickstarter, and I was under the false impression. I think Kickstarter, so another takeaway for somebody who's planning on launching a product on there. I think it's great. We've got kind of, we're meshing two different uh, uh, genres of creatives here, game makers and industrial designers. So whether you're making a product or you're making games, I think it holds true on either way and you're going through crowdfunding. Um, I had the impression after looking through Kickstarter's um, pages and their suggestions on how to get featured and all this stuff that it was really about quality of presentation and polishing your product and making it sellable. And I have a background in animation. I have another friend, a mentor of mine who animated at Pixar and we're both savvy when it comes to presentation and marketing and so forth. So we thought, oh, we got this one in the bag. We're gonna, we can make a video that's way better than exploding kittens. We're gonna blow this out of the water. It sounds um, like our first mm. Toy Fair. Yeah, no. We went to Toy Fair and thought, this is going to be huge. And we sold 48 games across the seven day show and uh, oh. spent $10,000 on our booth, marble floor. I mean, we could, I could take you down that rabbit hole. And oh, we just were devastated man. and uh, eventually figured out that it wasn't an order writing show and orders did come in eventually, but it was a very long haul. <laughs> yes. So it's more like a game of chess. You have to make strategic moves and anticipate that it'll pay out a little bit later down the line. Well, tell me, so I guess I should ask, have you run campaigns and done crowdfunding through that channel at all or not Not really? We have not. You know, some of the biggest funded projects on Kickstarter are games, uh, Frosthaven, sure. and you mentioned Exploding Kittens and others. And I think that sort of was people treated it as a gold rush and let's let's go do a game. But as you found out, we sort of discovered that um, you really need a network and all the games that are successful had people behind the Kickstarter that have very vast networks of people behind yes. them and, and launched it. Um, we're considering doing one actually, uh, a, a toy idea. So we sort okay. of have to get our ducks in a row, but I have not gone yeah. down that road. Um, we did a crowdsource campaign for the inventor of operation which led to a movie um which i'm sure you know about yes called, uh, operation operation but we were able to fund his surgery that he needed that he couldn't afford so i do yes. know the power of crowd funding so uh that that's pretty cool when you get a bunch of people together all pointed in the same direction sure well um if you guys decide to go that route and if you have questions like I'll, I'll i'll share what knowledge from my small experience there are others who have had far more uh, uh dominoes of, of successful campaigns but i had one i mean we scraped by by the skin of our teeth and we did get funded and we fulfilled and and it was a wild ride learned a lot from it but i guess my main takeaway and you touched on it which is a great one that people should be aware of um, you earn every single one of those backers and it's a lot of front loaded effort to building a community, building a following. So if you're making a game, if you're making a product, I don't know, I might argue to say that it, it might be a little less competitive on the uh, physical product development side of things just because starting up like the barrier to entry for creating a card game like I did was is a lot lower because what's unique about it is the ink on the paper really. It, 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 there's no tooling, no injection molding. Well, not everyone. Sometimes there's custom parts that get injection molded for games and so forth. But if it's a simple game like that, there's a lot of them that are out there because people have the same idea. Oh, this isn't going to be too crazy to get into. It'll be easy. We'll just do this, launch it on Kickstarter, and then we'll make millions. Uh, well, it's quite. similar to the, to the film industry. You, you used to be you needed $100,000 to make a film. Sure. And when it went all digital, the, the good news is that anyone can make a film. And the bad news for filmmakers out there is that 
anyone can make a film. And you touched on the fact that, you know, there's a low bar barrier of entry for card games, board games, as compared to toys. Um, about 5,000 games come out every year. There are the ones that are actually printed, not counting, of course, the ones that are uh, invented and pitched and, and never see the light of day. So it's extremely mm -hmm. competitive. Um, yes. You need not just a great idea, but you need a marketing plan. You need the uh, ability to sell the game. You need the right price point. It needs to fit in the store in the right place. I mean, there's a lot of things we could get into as far as hurdles, but uh, that's what makes it a great industry because it's not yeah. easy. <laughs> Well, you got to earn it. You got to make it happen. So I want to have you go in a little bit more detail and tell us about now what's going on, what you have going on, um, and how has the recent events of this last year with the pandemic and stuff, how has that impacted the industry? I mean, there's reasons where one could assume that it's helped things blow up because of time that people now have. Other things could really keep it from going. So um, having an insider scoop on what's actually happening, give us an update. Like, how did the pandemic imp impact everybody? And what has that done to change your strategy as you go forward making and creating games? Yeah, the pandemic definitely uh, boosted sales. Um, okay. Because people were, were home and, and games and puzzles were up, I think, 30% the last time I checked from the year prior because people needed things to do at home. Um, I think there's a lot of anxiety and stress that also accompanied that. The, the, the good news, the bad news was people are struggling out there, you know, so I think yeah. we're going to see a trend of, of um, products, I hope, that are, are going to help people deal with those, th that, those issues. Um, for me personally, you know, I was in the middle of COVID or just the start of COVID rather. And I, like a lot of people was consuming Netflix and just consuming way too much and not creating enough. And that's when I decided to launch my YouTube channel. Um, where's the fun from where I took some of the research that I've done for my books and my films and sort of used it to create videos about uh, celebrating inventors. A lot of my projects do that because I'm a big fan of designers and, um, at the same time, I had two friends in the industry, Peggy Brown, uh, who's a, a designer, has three or four games in Target right now, who's the goat and count your chickens. And uh, uh, there's a, a, what is it? The uh, Heinz ketchup and craft mm -hmm. uh, games. Those are three that come to mind that she has in Target. So amazingly pro prolific inventor. And then another friend, David Yakos, who uh, has a game called Break In and Target, you know, he's, he's amazing as well. And in talking to them, they produce a lot of prototypes and a lot of concepts. And it really inspired me that, that, you know, in a lot of ways, this is a numbers game. And you started this podcast, Russell, by saying, you know, you need to do new stuff. Do um, new stuff. So COVID has, and talking to them really has inspired me to create some toys. I have a couple of toys that, we're hoping to one has found a home. Um, hopefully, will come out soon, and a couple others. Uh, I'm got my fingers crossed. So it's been a rather we prolific are too. Time we're for hoping me. for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, good for you. And and I and we're gonna talk. I'm gonna definitely give you an opportunity to talk about um, your process, what inspires you, and so forth. Uh, we had a a, a call prior to uh, hopping on today, which is which is normal. And you mentioned that uh, you had some stuff that you might want to show us. Some some old prototypes. Were you able to pull those out? Or, or did oh, you not bring them today? I, I didn't grab them. I'm sorry. You didn't I, grab I them. No, that's OK. If I you, wanted to. So I can see the final behind I, you. I, I can go get a few. I've got, there's a yeah. game cloak here that's off camera that, cool. yeah, there's a couple games that we have. We will have a commercial break later on in the show. If you, if you'd like to go and grab it, you're I more than welcome to. Yeah. <laughs> and be right back. Well, I, I want to give you an opportunity. So, uh, to, to talk about the things that you've done recently, and I will put a plug in here. I enjoy thoroughly enjoy watching Tim's show on YouTube. Um, as far as I am a, a process junkie and showing and knowing everything that goes into creating something that's so iconic that it's almost become invisible part of our culture. It just is. 
I, I think everybody has grown up playing Twister as a kid. Yeah. And somebody has a friend who's thrown the Monopoly board across the living room at least once. Sure. I mean, like, so. Well, uh, that's, in a lot of ways, that's what inspired my books is the, the fact that if you create a piece of music that sells a million copies, you get the cover of Rolling Stone and they give you a platinum record. And if you write a novel that sells a million copies, that's going to be a movie because you just don't sell a million copies of a novel. It's a huge yeah. number. Well, Candyland has sold 150 million copies and counting, and very few people know Eleanor Abbott, the school teacher from San Diego who invented it. So, and you yeah. could pick almost any hit toy or game, and the inventors are relatively unknown. So, the fact that they've given mm. us so much joy and connection and family time. Uh, I believe they need to be celebrated much more than they, they, they are. But there are people like I see Mary Cousin is on the call. Um, her people of play group in Chicago. I mean, they do a wonderful job of celebrating inventors. And um, they have an annual show in November that brings the industry together and inventors and uh, toy uh, companies that are looking for product come together and deals get written there and inventors get celebrated and young inventors get uh, mentored and it's just a, a wonderful thing so there's a lot of people out there that really want this industry to thrive and continue definitely and and you are absolutely right these people they're like the uh you know covert incognito influencers of our time you're not going to look at someone in the grocery store and know oh they've like created this epic game that everybody has in their household they're just gonna buy their bananas and go on and you'll not no 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 know the difference um i do on that note want you to go a little bit deeper and share with us the process of what you went through to get your idea mega mouth on the market because <laughs> i know that that wasn't like a just a streamline in fact there's a whole video on your channel if people want to get into the nitty gritties about it i know that it inspired me but i think we can go a little bit deeper than some of the topics we talked about there i know you prototype i'll let you share the story but uh if you can specifically hit on for me before i let you pass you the podium and go on um i'm curious so can we talk about and hit on the the overall experience what it takes um how you connected with the right people to, to talk with them and, and pitch this idea. And then um, the therefore what, like it's a business. We're all hoping to, yes, bring joy and laughter to everybody because it's a fun game. Um, but I think it's good for people to understand the realities of what they can expect as they're going in to, uh, to pitch to somebody. I, I just know that when I was pitching my game, I have a pretty realistic understanding of how markups go from my background in product development. But I remember specifically talking to a buyer of a chain of stores here in the Twin Cities who said, yeah, most people are confused and they think that they can sell it to us at like full retail. And then we'll somehow like, it doesn't work like that. We, you have to, there's markups and everybody has to get a cut. And by the end, what is the price of going to be? Anyhow, uh, that was a long thing for me to say, okay, hit on some of that stuff and tell us your story about Mega Mouth. How did that transpire? Because I know you were inspired, you did stuff and made it happen. Well, I have a buddy who's a stand-up co comic and I have another friend okay. who's a songwriter and they say the same thing, that a song lyric or a joke can come from anywhere. And, a, and the same thing is true for a game inventor, right? You could be looking at something. I, I saw a chipmunk in my parents' backyard and its head was bigger than its body. And I realized hmm. that, oh, it's got nuts in its mouth. And I thought, oh, a kid would love to feed a, a, a chipmunk or a squirrel. And that led to a game called Feed Bunny. Um, I was looking at yes. ne Russian nesting dolls and how they nest inside one another and that led to a game called you've been framed which is on the market with mega mouth it was very similar i have a game company called rue games that i founded and i fly to taiwan usually every summer not the past two summers um, right. but before covid i was there with my partner dennis callahan who owns the, the company there and we were in a grocery store in taiwan and in taiwan before covid if you serve food in a grocery store you know samples like they do in the US, you have to have a shield uh, covering your mouth, even before COVID. Mm -hmm. 
And I saw this young woman, you know, handing out crackers and cheese to people. And she had this, this plexiglass shield uh, across her mouth. And I thought, you know, if that was a magnifying glass, that would be hilarious because her mouth would be big yes. and her head would be normal size. And we developed it with Rue Games, my, the company I mentioned. And we weren't doing party games at the time and it really didn't work out. And since I'm an owner, you know, we, we, if, if it doesn't work out there, then um, I'm, I can take it up elsewhere. And I brought it to yeah. Big G Creative at the People of Play conference two years ago. We met at Navy Pier. And I showed them the the prototype for Mega Mouth, which I'll get when the commercial break yeah, happens. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, you know, I had a, a working prototype, and they played it, and and they loved it. It was hilarious because it was, you know, basically lip reading, but it's just funny to see people's mouths so big, big. and uh, it's it's done really well. I got nominated for a Taggy Award for uh, oh, Game congrats. Innovator of the Year, and it's been great. So. Big G has been oh, a wonderful congrats. company to work with too. So to answer your question, Russell, I had connections at the time when I had that idea. So mm -hmm. the, the time frame was shortened dramatically because I had a manufacturer and a partner in Taiwan and I had relationships with people for someone new to the industry. It, it's going it, to, you have to know, it's just going to take time. You know, when yeah. Tribon, the idea for Tribon came, it was literally selling it out of the trunks of our cars, knowing no one in the industry and uh, it just it it it's going to take a while to to break in. That's for sure. So who are we looking up on LinkedIn when we've got an idea for a game to try and connect with? What's like the who's the person? What's their job description? What's their title that you're going to try? Well, I guess first, are they going to be on LinkedIn or are they like they? It's so hard to get a yeah, hold of them. They prefer you know, it to stay LinkedIn that way. <laughs> yeah, LinkedIn is a wonderful tool. tool. Um, however, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the inventor relations people, right? Um, right? They're probably, I'm quite sure because I know several of them. In fact, in a recent Zoom call, one from Hasbro said how she was inundated. So I don't know that LinkedIn is the best way to go. I will say that, the, in full disclosure, I'm on the board of directors for the People of Play Conference in Chicago. So I am biased, but there's a part okay. of that tract for new inventors where you can pay to hear uh, professional inventors tell their stories and give advice, but also have an opportunity to meet with the inventor relations people from major companies, not just in the U S but all over the world. So um, that's a great venue to in, in trying, instead of trying to hit individual inventor relations people on LinkedIn, I would recommend going to a trade show like the people of play or Chicago toy and game fair, which was formerly known as, um, and, and, and do that. There's also a, a, a website called uh, People of Play where you can have your own profile. It's sort of the LinkedIn version of the toy industry where you can have a profile, show uh, what you want to show in terms of success and what your specialties are. Mm. And that's a great way to connect with people in the industry as well. Okay. This is good because like, if you've never been there, you're not just going to know this stuff. So take notes, everybody who's looking to get into the toy industry. These are the places that you need to make connections with people. And I think you bring up something that's really good too, because it's almost like the low hanging fruit, the go-to simple way to get in touch with somebody supposedly is to just reach out and send them a message on LinkedIn. But I think you bring up something that's important is to put yourself in their shoes and imagine how many messages that they're getting and how inundated you're what they are with all of the requests to meet to pitch ideas and so forth sure. we need to be a little bit more we're creative in creating games let's be creative in how we connect with people and really think things through and it also goes to show that likely the ones that make it through and find success have, there's a measure of tenacity that's part of it they have figured out other ways that's not going to I'm not getting through this way try a different one try a different one sure. and pound the pavement and maybe go old school and just meet them at an event, <laughs> just go. We can't be lazy and somehow expect um, to get results. Yeah. Well, and that's true that, you know, the, the other product of COVID is the fact that many invention meetings are now over Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Teams. And um, I would say that one of the skills that every toy or game inventor has to have or find somebody that, that does is filmmaking. You know, you have to make a demo mm. video of your game or your toy in order to pitch it because 
more frequently people aren't doing that in person and they're doing it over zoom and then you have to that video represents what your product um i will say for people that are interested in pitching at shows there's a wonderful resource i was and that's not because i moderated this panel it was the people that were on it but i had the inventor relations people for mattel hasbro spin master play monster um and i think one other um and it was how to pitch a toy or game and there's a video that you can okay. find at the people play website it's somewhere posted up there and it's from the inventor relations people's mouth of what to do in a pitch meeting what not to do um and it was you know really a great resource that that people can check out mm. hey so you get the meeting the pitch goes well and they say we want it that's what they did with Mega Mouth, and you're like, okay, then what? I get fifty percent? No, does not not that much. I mean, you you'd love to make that much. Give us a realistic understanding of how these kind of uh, obviously different contracts are going to vary, and different companies will have their. Um, uh, it's negotiable and to a certain extent, but I think it's good for people to understand, like when you're coming in. As far as I understand it. Yeah, not 50%, not 40%, not 30, not 20. Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. Where does it generally, when you're talking about your royalty percentage, um, as far as I was like three to 5%, and that's kind of good. I don't know. You tell me, what can people expect um, to get from that? And how does that, It's. I know it's not always upfront, here's a check. Um, elaborate on- Sure what your experience was like and, and share what you, what you feel comfortable sharing from that. Well, the industry has changed. When I first got into it, there were option payments that um, were fairly frequent where you'd show a, pro a game or, or a toy to a company. And if they liked it, they would consider it, of course, for maybe a week or two, but then they needed to get back to you and option that, which would mean you can't show it to anyone else and they would have the rights to it. Um, or not. And those sort of payments have been uh, less and less frequent um, over the years. Uh, it's still possible. Um, the amount of the options have changed. I remember with Tribon, a game, a company called Tyco uh, optioned that game for $15,000 on a Thursday. And on a Monday said, they're not going to proceed with it. And hmm. thank you very much. 15,000. There was a deeper story to that, why that happened, sure. but $15,000 is a big option payment. You, typically, uh, nowadays, it's closer to say 5,000 if someone wants to hold it for okay. um, a, a month, say. But the royalty, you're right, it's typically five to 7% is okay. a typical range of the wholesale selling price of the product. If okay. there's a license involved, say Star Wars, I invited, I invented a toy that could also have a Star Wars license and let's say Hasbro has the license to Star Wars, they're gonna lower my royalty to make room for Disney who right. owns Star Wars, right? Mm -hmm. So typically in that case, you're gonna get closer to three, you know, maybe even 2% because it's a Star Wars item. In theory, you're gonna sell a lot more of them. So you're gonna do okay there. Um, but five to seven, and inventors that don't know how the industry work get very offended by that because a lot of them think, oh, I, oh, I want 25%. Yeah. Um, but you have zero risk. Sure. You know, the toy company is taking all the risk. They're going to manufacture this product and market it and warehouse it and ship it and collect from stores and deal with stores that don't pay them and go bankrupt, et cetera, et cetera. And you get to sit back and just get a passive income, Check. which is that yeah. royalty. Um, so that's typically how it works. But, you know, there's a lot of deals as anyone that is in the in the inventing community knows you you have companies that are interested and then you think you're going to strike a deal and then it, it just doesn't quite work out and it, it falls through, through. Um, in the case of mega mouth with big g you know it ra happened rather quickly they played i had a prototype ready they took it in they played it they thought it was great fun and we we struck a deal so um sometimes yeah. they go really fast and sometimes it takes a while takes a while well <laughs> Yeah, you, one thing to kind of point out is people get hung up on those percentages. And I understand when it's your baby and that thing that you've invested so much time and effort into. So I guess the antidote probably to getting overly attached and being concerned about getting the whole pie versus what little slice 
um, is making more the numbers game, throwing out and having a bunch of different things that you're creating uh, probably will help you be a little bit less attached, but also keeping in mind, you know, I can have a hundred percent of this teeny pie or I can have a lick of Hasbro's pie that's going to partner with a major retailer. You know what I mean? And the lick of their pie is significantly more than your little one. And then the amount of risk that's involved. Um, explain, uh, clarify for us a little bit on as far as, um, so they're taking on that risk that you established a number when it comes out to pay out. I understand with toys and games, it's, there's generally a time phase where it's like quarterly. They'll see however much is gone and th there's a lag. It's not like they're like, welcome to the team, Tim. Pff, here's your fat check. I mean, maybe there's some contracts like that. I don't know. But as, as I understood, um, if you were trying to start a toy industry and you're doing jobs like that all the time, you'll get one, it's signed, and it's taking a while to roll out, and you're still not paid, and so you've already got to be on the next thing, and somehow the checks roll in after the fact sure. later on. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. you're typically paid once the toy company is paid or shipped. In some cases, when they ship product, you're, the inventor is paid, and that's a better deal for the inventor. Or in some mm -hmm. cases, you're not paid until they're paid on the inventory. And that's typically more when you're dealing with FOB shipments, you know, out of China where you're shipping lots of games. Uh, I don't mean a lot. I mean a lot of say 2,500 or 5,000 games to a company. Mm -hmm. You typically get paid when that company buys those games from the factory. But in more cases than not, an inventor in the U S is going to be dealing with a licensing agreement where the company would ship the product. You'd be paid uh, on the quarter previous to that, and they would include a royalty uh, uh, breakout of this is who we sold the games to, this is your royalty rate, and you would be paid in, you know, uh, in that regard. Um, your other question was, I'm, it's escaping me now, you mentioned... Uh, the... I, me too, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen to the recording and then I'll realize it'll, what yeah, I missed. Yeah, it'll come back to me, I'm sure. <laughs> But, uh, That's okay. Well, well, that, so I did remember what I was going to say. There are hybrid cool. examples, and there are people that okay. either they launch through Kickstarter or they they raise money themselves. They print the game or the toy themselves. They start to sell it, and then they sell enough copies where it has enough traction in the specialty market. Say that a bigger company comes along and says, "Hey, you, you're doing really well. We want to license it." And in that case, you're going to warrant a a slightly bigger royalty, right? You're going to be closer to the seven, eight, maybe percent um, or more, you know, it depends on how well you're doing yeah. in the specialty market. There's a lot of examples of games like apples to apples. Tribon was one of them. Blurt was one of them. Mad Gab's another one where mm -hmm. the games have some traction and then bigger, bigger company says, Hey, you know, we'll take it from here. And in those cases, of course, you're going to earn a bigger royalty because you've, bigger royalty. you've proven the product, so to speak. Sure. Well, that's good. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to kind of clarify that. I mean, it's, uh, the hope is that, that whoever's tuning in, it gets a very clear understanding of how this, you know, first off, if you get your foot in the door, if you get that first, you know, yes, um, what can you expect? And, and the clearer the picture is for them, the more that empowered they can be. All right. So you shared something on your channel. It was a video called Using the Power of Play to Be Doer of Deeds, which when I saw that, I was like, ooh, ooh, this is going to be good. And there's one visual that I'm going to put up on the screen right now that I'd love for you to just quickly walk us through because as game creatives, as product designers, industrial designers, engineers, all of us can really benefit from understanding a little more. We've talked about this buzzword on the channel before, and I am excited to see it come between these different genres of creativity and, and, and come up yet again. So ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at this flow chart right here. Uh, for those who are gonna be listening on the, the podcast, sorry. Um, essentially, we've got an XY uh, graph here where Y axis channel level uh, sorry, challenge level vertically, and then skill level are being plotted. And you pulled this from 
um, Finding Flow, a, a publication back in 1997. And you talked about it specifically on your channel. And I wanted yeah. you to hit on it again for all of us creatives because it. I know we go through cycles of um, excitement about what we're doing, cycles of creativity. And seeing this visual representation just hit me and I went, oh, of course. And it gave me a therefore what to do when it comes to how do I kick things up a notch again, get it going again, and hit that flow state. So why don't you take a sec and walk us through essentially what you did in more detail on your video, but as the cliff note version for our folks here, Tim. Sure. Yeah, so what we're looking at is a flow chart. It's by a Hungarian psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he studies flow, which is that state that we've all heard of where athletes can't miss, you know, everything they do just works. A writer might describe flow as, you know, they were unconscious and the stuff just came through them. Um, so a lot of creative people uh, and athletes as, as well have experienced flow. And basically, it's kind of hard to describe if you're not looking at what we're looking at, but the, the vertical axis is challenge uh, level, the, the horizontal axis is skill. And if your skill is quite low, like you're new to the industry, say, but what you're challenging yourself with is quite high, say you're learning how to play piano, and uh, you're going to play live in front of a bunch of people that you've never played with before, the upper left side of this quadrant, you're going to feel anxiety over that because your skill level just doesn't match the challenge that you're, you're facing. But as your skills progress through your career, um, you, you kind of move out of anxiety toward being aroused, like, hey, I'm, I'm on to something here. And then flow is in the upper right-hand quadrant of this chart. And that's where the, the most productive uh, uh, energy comes from. It's where, you know, things start to happen. And what I shared in my video, which I've experienced of late, is the fact that uh, how we challenge ourselves matters. Because if you fall out of flow and you're not challenging yourself continually, you move from flow down to control. Now, there's nothing wrong with control, but it's not where the best ideas come from. And then certainly if you don't challenge yourself uh, and you fall even lower as far as the challenge uh, is concerned, you, you go down into relaxation. And I don't know anyone who's created anything really impactful and meaningful when they're relaxed, right? You're just sort of in a different state. So I discovered that in order to stay up in the, my most productive zone, the zone of flow, I need to constantly challenge myself and uh, try to do things that I'm not comfortable doing and push myself. And uh, that was very instructive to me. So I shared that in the, in the video that you saw. Yes, it is inspiring and it gives me so many good things to kind of chew on. Well, I would love to just keep on going on and on about that, but we do have a brief commercial break that we're gonna have. We'll come back, open up the lines for those who'd like to participate in our Q&A. So everybody stick around, we'll see you in a few. I'm gonna go get my prototype. first had Slinky, we were so concerned that it was a fad, but I think if it were, it's one of the oldest fads around. Well, by the time we got 10 minutes into the game, nobody could stand still because they were laughing so hard. We could see that the game board could be on the floor and the people could be the playing pieces. We're creating upside down chin characters for some play kits. This is the last photo shoot before my pitch to Hasbro next week, so they need to look good. I want an inventor to show me something that makes me go, wow. Look at me. <laughs> so it's an interactive toy that kids can use to create their own characters. <laughs> this is my second year in development on Crazy Chins, and I've never spent this much time developing anything. 
It's bling bling. It's based on a popular CeeLo dice game. I'm with Salad Bowl the game. This is Yakko Ball. Junk Ball. Thumb Ball. Yamoto. Blongo. I'm looking to do about 15 million a year. My goal when I designed the game was to get a reaction. Careful if you touch the sides. In any case, they said, call it Play-Doh. <laughs> I thought it was very funny. At that age, you think false teeth are funny. <laughs> the ants have been good to me. Put three kids through college. The ants paid for it. <laughs> she said, toy design? Well, what, what kind of toys did you design? I said, well, uh, my favorite was a toy called Light Bright. She said, Light Bright? I used to love that when I was a kid. <laughs> I love this business. All right, everybody, welcome back. We appreciate you sticking with us. Um, Tim, I just got to say my favorite part of that trailer for your the video that you created uh, that, that film was the um creator of the ant farms voice because it was exactly as i would have pictured somebody who had invented ant farms would be when i saw it, i no just lie. i loved it i was like three ants they paid for my kids college <laughs> and i just thought that was fantastic <laughs> like, of course yeah he's a sweet man. um yeah oh look like very look very nice very approachable so um we've got a few people who are in on the chat um you guys are welcome to ping me if you would like to interject and have an opportunity i'll gladly unmute you and allow you to talk with tim some folks like to just be spectators and some like to get involved so whoever if you're on if you fall into the I like to talk with Tim category, or if you're somehow too intimidated, that's okay. Um, in the meantime, I had, oh, we want to see some of your prototypes that you've um, that you've run and grabbed for us, because I think that would be fun. And then yes, I... Um, I was going to say, and then we'll just uh, wrap up with the last final questions. So go ahead, show us what you brought. All right, well, my first prototype is a game called Tribond. So this is the hand-painted prototype to Tribond. Oh, that's wow. Supposed to be, that's supposed to be marble behind that. But uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's hand-painted. That was the first one. And then I have a game called uh, Blurt, which is with Educational Insights. And this is the prototype to Blurt, which I call Definitions. <laughs> which was okay. a really bad name uh my wife said if you're gonna do a, a she was my girlfriend at the time she said if you're gonna do a, a word game you can't misspell the name uh that that doesn't work uh she yeah. was right by the way and then these little <laughs> things so this is a this is a little plunger you see this and where i found this was online what you're supposed to do is you stick it on the back of your phone and it holds your phone up you know so you can watch a movie right so when i saw these online i said you know i bet they would pick up cards really well so i ordered a bunch of them and long story short that became a game called bullseye which is on amazon and rue games sells that quite well in the specialty market so you never know where games are going to come from so those are a few prototypes. Yeah. Oh man, that's fun. And that is the truth. Like even uh, the different consultancies, consultancies that I've worked at, getting your hands on some existing devices, taking them apart, looking at them. Um, we can sit behind a screen and hypothesize good solutions all the time. And sometimes what it really boils down to is you just need to get your hands dirty and get something. So seeing something and saying, I bet you I could do something with it. I am sure at the beginning, it wasn't like immediately, this will be how the gameplay could work. It was, I've got something to hold on to, something kind of neat. And then you roll with it and, and, and it turns and evolves into something else. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a wonderful book I would recommend called Play by Dr. Stuart Brown. And in that book, he talks about how uh, the hand is in search of the brain and the brain is in search of the hand. 
and play is the way that those two things kind of connect. And I have found it, and, and he tells a story of Jet Propulsion Labs trying to replace older engineers and having trouble doing that because the young engineers didn't play with their hands. And therefore they weren't as good at, at problem solving as the older engineers who oh. took apart bikes and took apart clocks. And there's a real push. I think we need a push for kids to play with their hands at a young age and continue that and, and you know, fine with the screens. They're never going away, but not at the cost of, of playing with their hands and figuring out how things function because that's going to make them better problem solvers. Okay. I 100% agree. Ooh. And I got to say, dang it. I said it I, as a podcaster uh, host, you, there are certain phrases that you catch yourself saying all the time. And that one rolled out of me on accident. A hundred percent agree was like, somebody told me once in my feedback, Russ, if I got a dollar every time you said 100 agree i'd be like a rich man right now so it slipped out of me guys but i do agree on that because even that translates over to industrial design we've kind of seen a disconnect of people being able to doing creative solving problem solving problem problem solving because we're we don't play with our hands we don't mess around with stuff nearly as much as we did. and so um I have a whole video on my channel about how do you get into design if you're a high schooler? Um, how do you get into design if you're in school right now? And uh, in all phases, working with your hands, um, getting some foam, doing some prototyping and creating in that sphere is always super helpful. There's that and practicing documenting and storytelling. So you talked about the power of having your pitch reel and that video, how that really sells it. You could have a what would be an award-winning game or toy in in your head or even created. And if you can't pitch it and sell it well, like it's never going to take off, which there's a question that just stemmed off of that, that I want you to address from Mary. She asked, what should a new inventor pitching not say in a meeting? <laughs> do you have any, like, do you have any well, like good stories from that? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, I, I, the biggest thing, and I, I learned this from Mike Hurdle, who used to be the inventor relations person at Hasbro. What inventors tend to do is they start their pitch meeting with who they are and why their toy or game is so great and how they came up with it and pretty much everything except actually playing the, the toy. And once again, it's yeah. putting yourself in the shoes of the inventor relations person get to the play right away. All that other stuff doesn't matter. And I know this, you know, I was a gatekeeper or an inventor relations person for patch products, now play monster for nine years. So I looked at a lot of ideas from inventors and even I didn't learn that lesson. You know, I, I pitched Mike something and he was the one that told me, Hey, you know, the story behind your thing doesn't really matter. Just get to the play. So that's the biggest thing I would say is get right to the play and and get to the uh, play you'll serve yourself well with that um and then you know there's there's a, a list of things not to do like um if someone says no move on right hopefully you have more than one idea that came up in our mm. pitch meeting uh panel where and, and the analogy i made was imagine if a stand-up comic told a joke that bombed and no one laughed and they said let me let me try to retell that. Let me let me try to tell that joke again. And they start to repeat <laughs> the joke. Would that ever work in a no. million years? Right. So if you pitch something to a, an inventor relations person and they pass, they go, no, nah, not for us. And you say, oh, well, I think and you start arguing with them. That's a no, no, because, you know, it's just that's not going to no, work. No. You need to need to move on. Um, those are probably two big ones. Okay, well, Chuck has a good question that he put in the, the chat right here. That's a great follow-up, I think, um, to that is how many ideas should you have in your hopper that you're working on in the background? You know, how many, you know, to, to continue the analogy, how many jokes do you have to follow up with that to, you know, to say that you're fully stocked and, and you're armed and ready? Like, how many right. things are, do you have going on? Yeah, I... I... I have quite a few little kernels of an idea, right? That it could be something. Um, I would say maybe tw 20 or 30. Um, but when I'm pitching someone at a trade show, 
like the people of play say, I pitch, try to pitch at least four or five things. Now I have friends in the industry that, that pitch 20, 30 things and, and I'm just not as prolific as them. I don't, I don't have that many mm -hmm. great ideas. Right. Um, but I, early in my career, I made the mistake. I, I remember flying up to spin master in Toronto and I had two items and it was a quick no for both of them. It was, yeah, we've seen something similar. That's not going to work. And then the second thing was, yeah, it's not for us. And then they were ready for my third item, which I did not have. And it was a very oh, quick no. meeting. And they were like, wow, you came all the way to Toronto with two items. And that was an expensive lesson to learn, right? So you, you want to have sure. at least four or five things, I think, um, in, in a pitch meeting. So I guess peek, I want to peek behind the curtain then. Uh, how many things do you have in the pipeline going right now, Tim? How many different things? Well, are I, you so I just had my Roo, my on? Roo games. Uh, we just had a Roo games meeting, and I pitched six things in the first pitch meeting, and a couple of those were eliminated. Oh wow! And then we had a second meeting, and we riddled it down to I think three or four, and I landed on one. So there's one new item coming out with Roo games um, that I have worked on, and now it's the uh, the hard part of actually making a prototype and creating the content, um, which is a lot of people pitch concepts. Um, and this is more of a game. This has more to do with games than toys, because if you have a toy mm -hmm. idea, you really need to have a functioning toy or, or a prototype at yes. least um, to, to proof of concept say to, that this thing actually works with a game. A lot of times you can pitch a sheet, that's just a sales sheet of, okay, this is how I think it's going to work. And you know, how it looks mm. is irre irrelevant because the company's going to decide how it looks, maybe even what the name is. Um, but then if they want to bring it in and test it, now you got to make a prototype, right? Now you've got to make a physical thing that they can actually test. Um, so a lot of inventors I know pitch for games, pitch concepts, sell sheets, and then if they get interest, then they actually make the prototype. That's smart because a lot of times you'll spend all this time making a prototype. And if no one ever wants to see it, then you may be spent, you know, whatever, a week or two making a prototype that's no one wants to look at. Yeah. So a, a sales sheet is a good idea for pitching games. Mm, that's a good strategy. Okay. So I came across the, we're going to, we unfortunately we're just about out of time, folks. And I'd love to sit here and <laughs> pick your brain and on and on, Tim. I really would. Uh, I came across um, in one of your videos, you talked about Right Brain Red by Ren Geyer. And yes. you talked about the power of three magic words. What happens if? Yeah. Tell us about the, so how has that like been the slogan, the motivator, what happens if, how has that impacted you and, and, and helped shape your career? So right brain, right brain red is a book that I co-wrote with, uh, mm -hmm. Ren Geyer. It's really his book. I just helped him, you know, write it. And one of his tenants, one of his, uh, keys to success is that what happens if, and his, his contention is, and I agree that it, it really is an interesting way to start meetings. Um, people tend to say things like, well, I think we should do this, or I, I think this, or uh, they frame it in a way that can shut down conversation and brainstorming. And his contention is when you start a meeting with, well, what happens if we try to make a game that does X, Y, Z, or what happens if we do this? It's much more open-ended and it allows people to actually consider and get in a frame of mind where they picture okay if we were to actually do this make a game with a magnifying lens um how would that work you know would would we strap it to our head would the players just hold it up um you know having it strapped to their head was is going to add cost because now they have to wear something and are people really mm -hmm. going to want to do that what happens if we just ask them to hold up the magnifier themselves. Is that a no go or is that a simple solution? So the what happens if is a great way to sort of um, actually put yourself in that place visually that, okay, we're gonna really, let's pretend we're really gonna do this thing. What happens if it's this way or that way? 
And uh, Wren, who invented the Nerf ball, if people listening don't know, who invented uh, the game Twister, who has won a Grammy uh, in the country music business, who has an educational system that is sold in 1800 school systems around the country. You know, he's a mm -hmm. serial entrepreneur and he starts all his meetings, his brainstorming meetings with, okay, what happens if, and then he goes what from there, which I think if. is pretty cool. No, it is definitely very cool. What else is very cool, Tim, is a quote that I pulled from one of your videos that made an impression on me. You said, you said, I'm on a quest to inject some joy back into my work life. I want to gamify my goals to create games for the greatest good. Good for me, my family, and who knows? I want to be a doer of deeds. So... <laughs> Tell us, I, I mean, I like that being a doer of deeds. What are some of the ways that you personally are striving to be a doer of deeds? What's working for you and, and what, what can we do to be better doer of deeds? Well, we sort of touched on this when I was inspired by my friend Peggy Brown and my friend David Yakos. They simply, it's a numbers game, right? They create so much stuff that the likelihood of something being licensed increases exponentially compared to someone who's mm -hmm. only going to produce maybe two or three things, you know, a year. Um, so the doer of deeds quote is sort of a take on Teddy Roosevelt's famous speech from the Sorbonne where, you know, the man in the arena and the someone, you know, so basically it's a contemplation of, you know, the critic who says, Oh, you failed. And um, rejections are just a part of this industry. You know, if you have thin skin yeah. and invent one thing and it gets rejected and you, you, your baby was, you know, thrown out, if you don't have the, the, the toughness to continue and come up with something new, then this industry isn't for you because it's a very fashion industry. And uh, there's a lot of people out there trying to do the same thing that you're trying to do. So you have to... Uh, actually make stuff and create stuff and that speech where you you found that quote was from me realizing you know i was consuming watching stuff and not creating enough and i just determined you know one one of the ways that i'm still in the process of investigating is what if i took play into my goal setting and gamify my goals and try to really make uh this fun after 30 years and so far it's worked. So that may turn into yeah. a, a, four, a fourth book, perhaps a fourth book. Good. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to be a doer of deeds and not just a, a consumer. Oh, be doer of deeds, everybody. In every episode of The Variable, we wrap up with one final question that we'll have you briefly answer for us before we let everybody go. Tim, what is your variable? What's that thing that you hold on to that makes it so you are who you are today and has proven to be a catalyst for success? Well, when I, my career first started, it was my work ethic, no, no doubt. I wasn't the most creative, but Tribon, we just, we worked 70 hours a week selling that thing out of the sure. trunk of our cars. But, you know, it's interesting. Now I'm 56, you know, 30 years later, I don't have the same drive as I used to have. So my variable mm. is no longer work ethic. It has to be something else. It has to be, you know, uh, I would say creativity, you know, and, and simplifying mm. because I think the older we get, we tend to overcomplicate our lives. And there's, you know, of course, with COVID and the internet and uh, social media, there's so many things pulling at us and I'm trying to learn to be quiet and just tap into creativity and uh, be that doer of deeds, as we said, and not just consume and uh, get distracted so i'm trying to find my my calm place where i can create more than more than consume find your calm place to create get in the flow um all good variables well everyone thank you so much for tuning in to the variable and tim thank you for joining us so many good insights we're grateful for you and and everything you've shared with us and you know what Good luck as you move forward. I look forward oh, to thanks, going Russell. to Target, following your career, and seeing more awesome games on the shelf. Um, it's been a pleasure. Well, I appreciate the chance to come on. Thanks a lot. It was fun. All right, everybody, stay in touch.